study was the aspirin esomeprazole chemo prevention study, which looked at a low dose aspirin with proton pump inhibitors in two different doses and we aim to randomise patients over a four year period and follow them up for a minimum of eight years and a uh, maximum of ten years. The purpose of the study was to decrease uh, three major endpoints which were overall mortality, cancer of the oesophagus and high grade dysplasia in the oesophagus. And the reason we wanted to look at three things is that patients with Barrett's oesophagus, in fact only two or three percent of them will die of oesophageal cancer, the vast majority of them die of other causes. So in other words to make a real d a dent in this death rate of Barrett's patients we needed to look at overall mortality. So we randomised to high dose 40 milligrams twice a day isomeprazole versus low dose 20 milligrams a day and aspirin and no aspirin. So there was two interventions but there was actually four arms which is high dose proton pump inhibitor with aspirin, low dose proton pump inhibitor with aspirin, high dose proton pump in its own and low dose proton pump in its own. So the trial was in a 2x2 two two factorial design, which means that we're powered to look at the interventions, but not at the individual arms. Okay. And what we've shown there, the high-dose protein pump inhibitor was very successful, significantly so, at decreasing overall mortality in patients with Barrett's esophagus. That was quite unexpected to us. And I'll be perfectly frank with you, even now we're looking at our data to see if we've missed out anything. Um, and the hazard ratio, we think, is about 0.8, so it's a 20% reduction in mortality. Okay, so that's much higher than we expected. The aspirin, in fact, we haven't shown significance at the moment, but when we censure for um, use of non-steroidal drugs, so these are anti-inflammatory drugs, the most commonest one would be brufen, then we have a significant effect with aspirin. And what seems to be happening, if you take aspirin and then you take brufen as well, you lose your benefit from aspirin because the brufen already has some of the anti-cancer or anti-inflammatory effects, so that we had to take patients who were taking these drugs out of the study. It was a protocol violation, we knew who was doing it when it occurred, so that we then followed them up until they had the protocol violation and we did that aspirin then became significant. The third important aspect of the study, all we've been talking about is the risk benefit here and we've been talking about the benefit aspect of it but it's very important to mention the risk. This is really important for chemo prevention studies. If you have something that's moderately effective but actually moderately damages the individual, that's not going to work in chemo prevention. You've got to have something that's moderately effective and very low risk of damaging them and that's actually what we found. We only had 1% of serious adverse side effects at the moment. There were many challenges and I would describe they broke into three different uh, areas. Uh, number one was actually trying to get the clinical community to work together. This was a pioneering study which was mentioned as such by Cancer Research UK. In fact it helped to pioneer the cancer research net that we currently have because it brought different uh, clinicians together in different hospitals. Well, that's the first thing. So it acted as a prototype and exemplar of how you could do things in other areas. The second aspect about it was the funding aspect. The study has probably taken about 16 to 20 million in funds, depending on how you calculate the funds uh, to actually run over 19 years. So that's much more than you would expect from an oncological study. The third aspect about it is actually keeping the uh, workers in the different sites motivated, because after a period of time, everybody's very keen to recruit to studies, but no one's necessarily very keen to follow up and look at the data. And we certainly achieved that, and I'm very grateful to the entire team. We collected 99.9% .9 of data, which is almost unheard of in trials of this size and nature. And the last aspect is trying to keep the patients on board because the patients in fact are very knowledgeable, they know about their condition and when they're being bombarded weekly with don't take protein pump inhibitors you'll end up with serious side effects or do take protein pump inhibitors they'll stop you getting cancer and don't take aspirin because you'll end up with gastrointestinal bleeds or intracerebral bleeds in your brain or do take aspirin because actually they're going to help you stop getting cancer. It's very important to try and keep people in the right randomise arms and I'm very grateful for the patient groups and the charities that worked with us to do that. The patients were the real success in this study. 
it's important to emphasise that um, epidemiological studies, they're very good. They're, in fact, they're particularly good at looking at side effects, injury and risk of damage. So we've got a good idea from that. What they're not so good about telling you is actually the cause and effect of drugs. So, for example, if I can give you um, an example, if you're on a high-dose protein pump inhibitor, you might be getting a lot more symptoms, so you might have worse disease. And it could be that some of the data that alludes to a high-dose protein pump inhibitor being associated with higher incidence of esophageal or gastric cancer are simply because these people had much more severe disease to deal with. But I'm not being um, complacent for one instant there. There clearly is a dichotomy of data. And actually, it could be that both are true. It could be that actually we followed up our patients for a cohort in time, and at nine years, it looks like that's a sweet spot. We've looked at a high-risk population. What happens if we follow up for another five or ten years? So I think we need to be very cautious. This is There's no magic bullet here. This is a very complex area, and the most important thing, we need patients and clinicians to understand is how you calculate individual risk and how you consent patients according to that. I'd start my advice at three levels. Number one, I would say that at the top level, we have submitted a, a paper to a, a major journal for publication, but we've already submitted it to one of my employers, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, for them to look at the raw data to see if they can come up with our findings. That's very important. It may be they'll look at it and they think that national recommendations need to change. It might be they'll look at it and think actually there's no need for any change because the data is not compelling enough, and that's the right way to do it. It shouldn't come down to investigators like me or indeed investigating teams such as ASPECT to make recommendations. It has to be done unemotionally and objectively by impartial uh, advisory bodies. Secondly, I would say to patients with Barrett's esophagus, if you have got Barrett's esophagus and you think you would like to take some of these drugs, you should speak to your uh, investigators or your doctors in the specialist centres or general practitioners because they can look at you, uh, you as a holistic uh, at whole and actually decide whether you have any of the risk factors and whether you would potentially benefit from that. And what we're positively saying to patients they should self-medicate on their own. That is categorically not the right thing to do here. You need expert medical advice. And the last thing is, I'm going to come back to what I alluded to earlier on, I think we need to follow up aspect for longer just to see do the curves start moving apart, do we get more of a benefit or actually do we start to seeing some nasty side effects creeping in.